for and that which is to come. He procured for us remission of all our sins and actual reconciliation with God, faith and obedience. Now, if all that sounds like a big word salad to you and say, I'm not sure what he's getting at here, I really want to focus more on the title. But what he's saying here for us is that when Jesus died, and more importantly for us today, when he was raised from the dead, something significant happened. Something that is at the very core of the Christian faith. That sin and death were now overcome and done away with. We've heard uh, in a, a song already today, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? So when Christ died, he overcame something we couldn't overcome ourselves. That is our eternal death and damnation according to God's righteous judgment. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so this idea that the death of death was found in the death of Jesus Christ is a concept that undergirds the resurrection. It's what we celebrate today. And so just having said that, we'll come back to that idea here um, at the end. Um, I want to ask you... Um, have you ever played, my goodness, look who walked through the door. Oh, sorry. Um, I was going to ask you if you've ever played the game, made you look. Because um, most of you, I made you look. Suzette, did you look? She always says her mom taught her in church growing up, you don't ever turn around and look back no matter what happened. You didn't look, I didn't get you. Um, well, when I was a youth minister, um, it usually happened on a long van ride, and it always turned out badly. Some of my students would play Made You Look. You ever seen it done this way, where you make this little sign, and if you can make somebody look at it, you get to punch them in the arm? I'm not suggesting that's a good game. Um, it almost always turns into you hit me harder than you, and it doesn't end well. Um, in fact, even it ended really badly. I don't know if y'all remember seeing in the news, but apparently this is also um, a sign um, for a white supremacist group. Um, and some members of our military got in big trouble because they posed for a picture, and a couple of them were doing this. Well, it turns out that they weren't making a white supremacist sign that they were playing Made You Look and thought it would be really funny that when their buddy saw the picture, they were making them look. Well, we're not going to play that game today. In fact, I probably even shouldn't have mentioned that now, probably for the rest of the service. There's going to be some really distracted people playing this game here. But what I do want you to know is in the passage that we're going to read today, Matthew makes us look. He is very intentionally using a word that he wants us to say, look. In fact, it's this word, behold. Now, that's not a very common word. I don't know, most of us don't run around using behold anymore. That sounds like a King James word, doesn't it? In fact, if you're going to use that word, you better be sure you're calling attention to something. In fact, if you get home and um, you've cooked lunch and you have a big silver uh, tray covered there and you say, behold, and you pick that up, it better be something pretty good under there. You usually don't say, behold, chicken spaghetti. Now, I love chicken spaghetti, but it's probably not a behold kind of thing. And so this word behold, let me just show you. I ran across this. Um, it's used in Hebrew and in Greek. Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. It's this little four-letter word here in Matthew's gospel, idu, I-D-O-U, idu. And it just means lo, see, or behold. Most of your translations um, will translate it something like that. And I love this. In other words, man, you need what I'm about to tell you. Um, I told somebody this week, um, in, in our vernacular, where we live in this particular part of the country, we could say, look at here, behold, notice something here. In fact, another place uh, I read said, and, and it's, um, for some of your versions, it can be translated in a way that really doesn't convey that kind of thing. It'll say suddenly or now or here or there, um, and it misses that impact of look behold this it's used to enliven the story in fact it's marking something important it emphasizes some detail or some idea 
And it's not always translated that way, unfortunately. In fact, I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of you, um, if you brought your Bible with you today, probably have the New International Version, the NIV. Um, it's used four times in these ten verses that we're about to read, but the NIV, for some reason, doesn't translate it um, any of the four times. In fact, um, in the NIV, um, it's going to be translated once as four, once not at all, and the other two times it says now and suddenly. So I'm going to read, and what will be on the screen here is from the English Standard Version. Um, it translates it three different times, and it uses the word see for the, th for the fourth uh, time there. But here's what I want you to know, is that I think Matthew is trying to draw your attention to some extraordinary things in this chapter. In fact, in this whole chapter, it's used six times. We're not even going to get to the last um, two, but he keeps saying, behold, behold, behold. So what's he want us to notice? So let's read these verses. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses 1 through 10. And if you have a different version that doesn't do that, if you want to pick up that um, Bible in front of you in the pew, uh, you can see uh, this word there. So this is God's word for us from Matthew's gospel, the 28th chapter. This is what it says. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. So everybody know where we are now? Um, Jesus has been crucified, dead and buried, put in a tomb and sealed up with a stone and a guard put outside the tomb. Verse 2, and behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. That's God's word for us today. So if you heard those beholds or saw them there, what are uh, these things? I think there's three main things that, uh, that Matthew is beholding us to. He's saying, look, don't miss this. Here's something important. And I think all of these things are the essence of the gospel. I want you to do something real quick. We do this occasionally. If you got a bulletin when you came in, look at the back of this bulletin. Um, we have our core values there, and our five core values are gospel, grace, truth, hope, and love. I want you to know that the resurrection, these important things that Matthew says in this part, and really the resurrection, to nobody's surprise, is in all four gospels. It feels the rest of the Bible about how important it is, but I want you to know that you can't know the gospel if you don't know the resurrection, that you can't experience the full grace of God unless you know resurrected life. You don't know the truth about Jesus unless you know that he is a risen, resurrected Savior that you don't know real hope for this life, that there is a resurrection for us that is promised as well, and that's where real hope is. And you don't know God's love fully as we ought to if you don't know that Jesus, yes, he suffered and he died and paid the penalty for our sins, but he was raised to new life. And so these aren't just things that sound good on paper and seem like we have some good thoughts put together. It is the essence of who, what makes us who we are as God's people. Without the resurrection, without those things, we are not the church at all. And so this behold starts with this. Behold this angel and really the things that surround this thing. So I'll put these verses back up here again. Um, it says several things, starting with first an earthquake. You would think Matthew wouldn't really have to point to that, but I think sometimes if you're like me, we read our Bible and something is so familiar to us 
that we pass it by without really thinking about it. Um, I met somebody here as by a show of hands. Anybody ever been personally in an earthquake? Nobody? Oh, one, two? Um, I am guessing, I have not, at least not that I'm aware of, not one big enough to actually uh, register with me. Uh, maybe I'm not as sensitive as a seismograph, but um, that's got to be a frightening, scary experience. Um, and for it to happen in conjunction with this big thing, and I think it should be uh, not mistaken that really what it says second is probably the main thing that caused all these other things that an angel descended from heaven. Um, so these things are not unrelated. That God's trying to get someone's attention. And as we see, he very definitely got the guards' attention that was there, and he very definitely got these women's attention that were there. But when there's an earthquake, and when an angel descends from heaven, and oh, by the way, his appearance was like lightning and his, his clothes white as snow. I don't know what an appearance like lightning, probably some kind of light emanating, maybe even a blinding light. Um, when they were practicing music in here, I was um, back here today in those big claps of thunder accompanied with the flashes of lightning were happening earlier this morning and these lights flickered um, in here. In fact, one of them I had just opened that door to the side just to see how badly it was raining and about that time a big bolt of lightning hit. I jumped and slammed the door and then heard the big crash. Imagine this scene that the power of God revealed in nature is happening at this moment and to say that their attention has now been drawn to what's happening here would be an understatement. But then I've always loved what I don't think is meant to be humorous but um, that the stone is rolled away and did you catch what it said the angel is doing? Sitting on that stone. I would love to have a photograph of that. What was the posture of that angel? Was he sort of saying, you know, check this out. How cool is this? Or um, we know that they were afraid of what was happening there. And then these strong, brave, well-trained, well-equipped Roman guards, we find them first trembling and then passing out, becoming like dead men. Now that's something to behold, isn't it? In fact, this, this part of it, part of me thinks, Matthew didn't really need to say behold before all this. If we were really seeing, I mean, if you're seeing this and experiencing this, I didn't need anybody to go, whoa, this is pretty cool. Check this out. Don't miss this. Look at here. And so behold this angel. And so we get this indication from the earthquake, from the angel, his appearance, um, all the things that go along with this. And even the reaction of these Roman soldiers that something significant, something worthy of paying attention to happens here. Well, what is that? Well, secondly, behold the announcement. And so now that I've got everyone's attention, the angel says, listen to what I have to say here. And what does he say? Well, we read these verses. He starts with... Um, uh, that after the, the guards become like dead men, the angel says, don't be afraid. In fact, angels have to say that almost every time they appear in the Bible because, I don't know about you, if an angel appeared here with us right now, the right reaction is fear to begin with. And when the angel says, do not be afraid, what a relief that is. In fact, we know um, at one place when we celebrate at Christmas, um, do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Um, sometimes the angels need to say, not every time an angel shows up does it mean bad news, because sometimes it does, and those people rightly feared. But then the angel says maybe the most important thing here. I know you were looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he's not here. He's not here. Now, you have to remember, everybody there has to be surprised at that. Both these women who are visiting there, in fact, one of the other gospel tells us they had brought something to anoint the body. They were not expecting. They weren't going to see if Jesus was still there. They were going to do something for the body of Jesus. And so when they show up and the angel says, don't be afraid, he is not here, there should be shock value as we read that. How could that possibly be? They've gone to great lengths to be sure that he was there. 
Guards were posted, the tomb sealed up with a stone, presumably um, too big for one person, maybe even groups of people to roll away. And yet, the angel says he's not here. But the news gets even better and maybe more shocking. He says, he is risen. Now it shows human nature. Jesus had been telling his disciples and probably these women were followers of Christ as well had probably heard that Jesus had said I'm going to be crucified and on the third day I'd be raised from the dead but it was human nature to think I've never heard of such. I don't know what he's talking about but they were not expecting that he would not be there and that he would be risen from the dead. And maybe one of the most important things that the angel says is that he is raised just as he said. And I love this. One person says, ask yourself this. If he can overcome the great barrier of death itself to keep his promises, to which, uh, then to which of his promises can I point that he does not, not also have the power to fulfill? In other words, if he can do this, what can he not do? To which circumstances in my life can I point that I might present an insurmountable barrier to the one who has overcome the grave itself to keep his words? Because Jesus lives, you can trust every word that he says. In fact, Jesus wants us to know that even something that seems as impossible as being raised from the dead, I said it would happen and now it has happened. And so if Jesus says, as Carl quoted this in the children's sermon, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. Then how do we come to salvation? Only through Jesus Christ because he can be trusted. There was this big event. Behold this announcement. Jesus is who he said he was. And in, in this phrase, he is not here. He has risen from the dead is the victory cry of every Christian believer everywhere. Is that Jesus is who he said he was, he's done what he said he would do, and now it can be applied to me in Jesus Christ. I love the story about a Muslim man that came to faith in Christ, and some of his friends uh, rightly asked, why have you become a Christian? Why has your faith changed? And he answered, and he said, well, it's as simple as this. Suppose you came to a fork in the road and there were two ways and you had to choose one of them. And in one road there was a dead man and the other there was an alive man. Which one of them would you ask which way to go? Have you thought about that? Christianity is the only religion, it's the only world religion that has a risen Savior, a living Lord. Lots of religions are based on a doctrine or uh, some worldview of some kind and maybe even someone who claimed to be a great prophet from God. But our Lord, our Jesus, is a risen Savior who's authenticated that he was the very Son of God and still lives for us today. And then what a great announcement by this angel. He doesn't just say, he's not here, take my word for it. He says, come and see. Go inside, see for yourselves. And if you read the other three gospel accounts too, we find out what they saw in there. His grave clothes were there, but Jesus was not. And I love this. One person says, by following the women into the tomb, we are to know that Jesus is risen. You see, that's why Matthew gives us all these details. He wants to set the scene for us. He wants to invite you into the story. You know, every good book and every good movie draws you in in such a way as where you feel like you're experiencing with these people. Matthew says, behold, look at what has happened here. Listen to what I have to say to you. Come and see for yourself. That's the message God still calls us to do today. You come and see. Come and see. Taste and see. The Bible says that Jesus is good. He is all that he says he is. And then he says, once you've seen, now go and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. You see, even Jesus' closest friends still were not understanding what was supposed to happen. So we've been talking about this as a risen king that... that Palm Sunday that we celebrated last a week or so before this event, 
Everybody was celebrating. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were, Jesus was proclaiming that he was the king, the Messiah that had been promised for 2,000 years or more. And they were celebrating that, acknowledging that Jesus was who he said he was. But then when Jesus died on that cross and was put in that tomb, they thought it was over. They didn't know where to go or what to do. And they had failed him. They couldn't even stay awake to pray with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter denied him out and out three times. I do not know the man, he said three times. And yet Jesus still came up out of the grave, still accomplished salvation for those very people who had let him down. And so twice in verse 7, it says, Behold, behold. The first says, Behold, you will see him. And in the ESV that we just read here, um, the second time it says, See, behold, he is going uh, before you. But really it says, Behold, you will see him, and behold, I have told you. He says, I want you to know for certain that Jesus is not here. He's been risen. And he says, I'm telling you, you will see him. What a great and precious promise that is. And it's why that Jesus' disciples, when they wrote some of what is recorded for us in the New Testament, they testified to this. Because when they saw, they believed. And it changed them forever. It changed the world forever. Listen to just two of his disciples, what they wrote. Peter wrote this, 2 Peter 1.16. Peter wrote, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, we ain't making this up. I'm telling you. In fact, he goes on to say in that same verse, we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. He said, I'm not telling you about something I just heard about. I'm telling you about something that I experienced. Now, we don't see Jesus in flesh and blood anymore today, but there are people here today who have experienced the presence of Jesus Christ in a way that they can say, he is real and you need to know him. Come and see for yourselves. John wrote this in 1 John, uh, the very first two verses that he wrote in that book. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and which we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life that was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life. See, John says, I've seen it, I've heard it, I touched Jesus after he came up out of the grave. And what I'm telling you is eternal life comes because of God's Son, the risen King. And so we see this response to faith, not just in the long term, but in the short term. What do these women do? It says that they, fear, they had fear and great joy. See, it is astonishing what God has done, but it ultimately it leads us to great joy. And then what do we do? It says that they ran to tell the disciples. Romans 10, 15, quoting a passage in Isaiah says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. One commentator said, we could apply this to these women, how beautiful are the feet of those who run to give good news. Why is it that we don't do that more freely and more passionately always? I was reminded um, this week as I was thinking about these women running to do that, how we neglect that so much in our life. That if something so astonishing, something that the gospel writers say, don't miss this, this is the most important thing that we could know, how we don't share that more. When I was in college, you should know, I went to a little bitty college. I knew it was small when I was there, but I didn't know how small. In fact, I've almost never met anybody that went to a smaller school. We had about 500 students. I graduated from high school in my graduating class with 400 people. My whole entire college had 500. So we knew most everybody on campus, and probably 95% of students lived on campus. Every male student on campus lived in one big dorm. We met. We knew each other. In fact, I, I probably knew over the course of four years, knew hundreds of people, their name and where they were from and something about them. My senior year, I was a Bible and religion major there, um, about to graduate, and it was a Christian college there. 
Um, and there was a young guy uh, who was a freshman that year, a baseball player on campus, um, and he had gone away on one of our breaks or holidays or something like that towards the end of the year and came back and started sharing with people that he had come to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. And lots of people were kind of saying, oh, that's so great. But then he began to ask people, how come you never told me that? Here I am at a Christian university full of people, or not everybody there was a Christian, but a lot were. Why didn't anybody ever tell me this? And I began to think, this is a guy, if you went to that school, you had to take uh, Old Testament survey and New Testament survey. So he, he sat in at least two Bible classes and didn't know Jesus. He lived in a dorm where there was nightly devotions that took place in that dorm almost every night, and he didn't know Jesus. He was required to go to chapel one day a week throughout both the semesters he had been there, and yet he didn't know Jesus. And he lived next door and down the hall and above and below lots of people, including me, who knew Jesus Christ, who knew that the, the Savior who had been put in a grave had died for our sins and was resurrected to new life was the only way, the only truth, and the only life, and yet none of us had ever bothered to share it with him individually. What if these ladies at this tomb had taken that path and said, boy, this is great news. I can't wait till word gets out. I hope somebody teaches a class on this one day. Uh, let's go and let's pray that people will know this. Those things are important. Classes should be taught and prayers should be prayed. But more importantly, we should run to share the good news of the gospel. And so ultimately, we are um, to share this good news that there is a risen king. And I love this. Immediately, Matthew skips um, some of what the other gospel writers do. We really just go to the next verse and he says that they met Jesus. And what did they do? When they met Jesus, the picture is that um, it tells us they laid hold of his feet and they worshipped him. You see, when the real Jesus is revealed to us, what else could you possibly do than to take hold of him and worship him? And in a spiritual sense today, no, there are not physical feet for you to grab on here today, but there is a Savior who is held out before you today. That that angel says to us today, he's not in that grave, he's in the world today. He lives to love and to save his people. Behold, your Savior lives. The death of Christ accomplished the death of death because he lives. So we're going to close with a hymn that says, Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. You see, the enemies of God are vanquished because <coughs> of Jesus risen from the dead. And we're going to sing, Hallelujah, Christ arose. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, it is with great joy that we also receive this announcement from this angel that he was not in that grave, he was not there, he was risen from the dead. And we thank you that you've come and met with us here today, that the presence of Christ is still with us, that you love us, that you died for us, you've raised us to new life in Jesus Christ. And so I pray uh, that the word of God would take hold of us today so that we might take hold of Christ our Lord, our Savior, the risen King. We thank you for that, and we ask you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen.